What's going on, guys? Welcome to a rundown. I am your host. I'm notorious when I'm Dom. I'm here with Strat Facts, but today we have WWF legend. We have the first African American Intercontinental Champion. We have the master of the Pearl River Plunge. We are here with Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, brother. How you doing? Doing good. It's a pleasure to have you on this show. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, let's get right into it, man. We want to know, like, how did you get into the business? How I got into the business, man, was um, Stevie Ray was a wrestling fan, wrestling fanatic. And me and Stevie Ray were like this, man. We were like brothers. And um, Ivan Pusky came to Houston and opened up a school. And he advertised it, you know, in the paper. And Stevie loving you know the profession the way he does he asked me that i want to come with him so i said yeah man i, I come i wasn't really a wrestling fan you know what i'm saying but i said yeah I, i'll come down there with you so i came with him man and we joined the school and the rest was history bro oh, i've gotten his brother booker t was there too <laughs> so that's yeah, how you yeah. got to that so that, uh to fast forward so that is that how you ended up in harlem heat in wcw harlem heat 2000 yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there's a tie to that. All right. That's what's up. Yeah, that went way back, man. That went way back to the street days, man. We used to, um, I'm telling you, we used to have fights in the streets, man, and fights at the club. If you mess with one, you mess with the other. And, you know, we protect each other, watch out for each other, man. And uh, we were like a two man street gang, <laughs> me and Stevie, at the time. But you knew big not to come around and mess around with us. You knew that. I wouldn't want to mess with y'all. Y'all some big dudes <laughs> back then. So I can only imagine. <laughs> John, what you got? Well, uh, Ahmed, uh, we can call you Ahmed. Uh, we, we, the, our show, the It Doesn't Matter podcast, you know, we had an episode a couple of months ago. It was, uh, for the, it was called For the Culture. It was about black athletes and in pro wrestling. And at the end of the show... We decided to do a Mount Rushmore of sorts of our top, you know, black superstars. And I, I was the only one that put you on my Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. So, so I was always, a, so when I got into wrestling, I got into wrestling uh, late 1995. And that's when you were just coming up really big in the WWF. And, you know, you were one of the top, you were the, you know the man you're the guy that i was really into at that time and 1996 was such a huge year for a lot of wrestlers including yourself and and you know i was you know of course like many of us were, were still a kid at the time and believing every single thing that was going on and <laughs> when, when you were uh raging the machine known as gold dust and breaking oh, down yeah. locker rooms and <laughs> you know uh farouk kicked you in the kidneys or whatever took you out of the title picture and got you out of the business for the rest of the year, man, I was so sad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man. And so that's why I put you in my route Rushmore, you know, not to say anything less of, you know, you know, Ron Simmons or the rock or whoever else. Um, but yeah, you were very, uh, you know, very influential in the very uh, formative years of me, uh, being a wrestling fan. So I just want to, uh, if no one ever tells you that, I just wanted to tell you that, let you know that. So, well, brother, I appreciate that, man. But what you know, these young wrestlers don't understand. These young African American wrestlers don't understand is that if I didn't win that championship and I didn't carry that belt like I did, you know, with, with pride and stand out of trouble and everything, this wouldn't put that belt on another black man. I promise you. Because oh, yeah. I mean, what year was that? Ninety six, ninety seven. When they gave me the belt. 96. Yeah. It took them that long to crown a black man champion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a long time, brother. Yeah. I mean, that long. And you have, you know, great wrestlers like Junkyard Dog, Bobo Brazil. You know, you had all these fantastic wrestlers that should have been champion. But, I mean, I was happy and, and, and praised in one, in one way because I knew I was open up doors for other blacks. But in another way, I was sad that it took them that long to open the doors up to minority wrestlers. Yeah. So you definitely felt the significance of that moment of being the first black intercontinental champion. Yeah, I, I feel good about it. But, you know, later on, once it start 
beaming down on me. I started thinking about people like Junkyard Dog or Robo Zill, uh, Ernie Ladd, and people like that. And it, it kind of upset me. It made me realize what I was really dealing with. I mean, you know, you, you, you did something that I should be grateful for, and I was very grateful for it, still grateful for it. But on the other hand, you slighted my other brothers, you know what I'm saying? And what what do you think would make it different for you than it was for any of them? Um, the intensity. Yeah. <laughs> the, the intensity, because they still are today trying to find another wrestler oh. with that much intensity. But what the wrestlers don't understand is, I wasn't faking intensity. That was really me. <laughs> and you get these new wrestlers on the down, and they all, you know, faking it. And you can tell they're, they're faking it, and, and it's not hit. And I think that was the big difference. So with all that intensity, um, it was all legit. So that scene backstage with Goldust, like, were you really like pissed off that that took off right there? You know, I was a little bit because I love Goldust. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he, he to me, he's he's great. I love him to death. But it really uh, upset me that he kissed me. Because we rehearsed it. And when we rehearsed it, he put his hand over my mouth like this, and you kiss your hand. And he knew it was live TV, so he knew there was nothing I could do as far as getting up and, and going after him or anything. It was live TV, so we had to go, you know, by the script. But when I got up, man, I was like, <laughs> no, he didn't. Just, he kissed me on nothing TV. I was, ooh. <laughs> Oh man! Because it must have taken you a while to forgive him, then. Huh? Because it must have taken you a, a while to forgive Dustin. No, I'm, I'm I'm, I know how he he is. I know he, he how he plays jokes on people and how you know he does stuff. So I I, I forgave him. <laughs> At that time, I didn't. Not that second. Oh man! Well, you were uh, pushed to the moon at that time when you first. Uh debut like you were like vince's go-to guy you were the, like the next big thing at that time and you had the intercontinental championship but i thought you were supposed to get a title shot against Shawn michaels like what happened with that you know what there's a couple of rumors out about that um one was that sean went to vince and told them he didn't think that the people was ready for a black champion a black world champion and that pissed me off to no end, man. I mean, I had the Incontinental Belt. I was carrying it as well as anybody else did. The crowd loved me. They popped for me every time I came out. And I think he didn't want it to go too far. You know what I'm saying? And to me, that that's... I, I just hate that I heard it. He said, I don't know if he said that or not true, because I didn't hear it. But I would hate if he did say that. That would really upset me. At that time, you know, um, yeah, you, you were in the program with uh, Shawn Michaels. You were the Incarno champion. Shawn was the uh, world champion. And uh, f we were going to see a six-man tag with your you two and the Ultimate Warrior against uh, Camp Cornette at the July In Your House pay-per-view. And then, you know, Warrior had his own issues, and he couldn't make it, and he was uh, replaced by Psycho Sid. Uh, do you have any special memories about that uh, certain angle? Yeah, Warrior... Um, I, I, they didn't come up with, I don't think they came up with the money that he wanted. They didn't, you know, have want to go pay him what he wanted to be paid. And he doesn't put it with any bullshit. Not backstage, not in, in real life or anything. And i um, tell you a thing that happened one time. One time I was coming into the arena and um, the warrior was there. I had never met the guy. And he knew me and he said, um, I'm Ed. He said, come here and get dressed with me in my locker room. So I was like, okay, cool. You know, that's that's cool. The Ultimate Warriors invite me to get, you know, dressed in the locker room so we can talk. And he kind of ran the rundown to me, like, you know, don't hang out with the boys unless, you know, they're legitimately your friends. You know, and, and always, he was talking about hotels, like, always make sure you stay at a comfortable hotel. He just schooled me, man, on what to do impressive wrestling because at that time 
when I got there to WWF, nobody, and I mean nobody but one person, tried to help me, and that was Razor Ramon. Razor would watch my matches behind curtain, and he would tell me, hey, this looked good, this didn't look good, do more of this, do less of this, and Razor Ramon kind of helped guide my, you know, career, but nobody else did, none of the brothers, nobody. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Don. Nah, so, so you're saying that um, nobody really helped you. So, uh, let me see how I want to ask this. Um, so, with Ron Simmons being the the top guy at the time in WCW, being here, like he was another top African American at the time at uh, in the WWF. Like he didn't sit down with you. He ain't trying to, you know, tell you the ins and outs of what to do and what not to do. No, brother, but the thing about Ron, and I, I, I give him credit for it, on the podcast, he admitted that he was jealous of me. He came straight out and said it, that he was jealous of me. And so that's where that kick that he did for real and all the other stuff came from. You know, and I take it that the other brothers were jealous too because here I was, you know, this green guy getting a push. But the thing about it, they didn't understand the fans believed me when I was in the ring. They believed that in intensity, they knew it was real, and they believed me. So that was the difference between me and the other black wrestlers. But no, none of them, none of them, man, none of them try to help me. Was there anyone else that gave you advice, like uh, you know Razor Ramon and uh, the Ultimate Warrior? Anyone else that pulled you aside and tried to uh, give you some career advice? No. no. Oh, I, I'm, no, I'm lying. I'm lying. Somebody that did help me, and he's the best trainer in the world, was Al Snow. Al Snow did, you know, get me the ring and, and show me some new moves and stuff like that. Yeah. Speaking of moves, uh, you know, you have one of the, you gotta be one of the most amazing finishers of all time. That Pearl River Plunge. <laughs> so, so sweet. Like, it's not just a Tiger Driver. It's so much more. Where did that come from? How did that develop? Yeah, it just developed as one of the things when I was practicing back in the days. It's just something that I, I seen it, the uh, Yunoki do it but in Japan, but they did it differently. Because I was in Japan for a year, too, in Yokohama. And they did it differently, so I added my own little twist to it, and it became Pervert Plunge. I mean, that, that move just, it looks great. It's brutal. It is a finisher. I love it so much. And, uh, of course, you had, you know, they always talk about the Bjorn Anderson uh, spine buster. Man, you got a great spine buster. <laughs> so, yeah, I love spine buster, man. Oh yeah, he does. God. Kill it. I love you know, spine buster. You know, you, know, you know what else that killed? That killed all my action figures whenever I did it to them. It broke <laughs> right in half. <laughs> but you know the thing about the spine buster, though? I was doing it and Ron was doing it. You know, before his finish, he would do it too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the spine buster is a, a heck of a move, man. If you don't, you know, if you mad at somebody, hit him with that spine buster. The back of the head hit that, that ground. They'll know what time to do it. <laughs> now you, yay. I had to straighten out a lot of people with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. So, you got to tell me, what was it like teaming up with LOD? Cause that gang warfare at WrestleMania 13, that was that was intense. That was was it Chicago Street Fight? Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Like y'all brought the heat. Y'all brought the oh, kitchen yeah. sink. Literally, like that was a dope time to to watch as a you know, such as a fan. Right. Me and me and Hawk dealt like 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 glue, man. But me and Animal, we liked each other, but from a distance. But Hawk was one that, that teamed with me. I mean, that really did with me. Because me and Hawk did a lot of shows outside of the WWF together with people that they didn't know. But we was doing shows, you know, outside the WWF on days off. And we would team up. And um, Animal, Animal just really didn't really get into it. Now, I don't know. He was jealous or mad or what, but he didn't get into it at all. <laughs> there it is. Look at that photo. What was it Here. like to don the shoulder pads? Huh? What was it like to wear the shoulder pads? 
Oh, that was great, man. I love the shoulder pads. Hawk gave them to me. Oh, that's dope. He gave me his shoulder pads. I mean, the, the shoulder pad had on. He let me keep them. I think they were his. And um, I donated them to a, um, a wrestling museum. All right. Guys, you know, when he passed away, man, he needs to be recognized. You know what I'm saying? Everybody knows the road words. So I just went and gave the museum the pads. I kind of wish I had them back now because I didn't know how much they were sold for. But um, I gave them away. <laughs> but I got a lot of a collector calling me. I think do I have them? And I'm like, nah. I gave them away oh, to the museum, man. Yeah. And I've been offering some very big money from things. I bet. Those are classics. Maybe maybe you can help reveal some behind the scenes knowledge. How do you travel with those things? The, the shoulder pads? Yeah. <laughs> They're all spikes um, and stuff. Or do you I just usually put them over my over my bag and have them sitting over my bag. And there it is. This giant weapon at the Air TSA. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Oh man. All right, so what was it like working with um, the Nation of Domination? Like, you guys were feuding for the longest time, then you ended up joining the Nation of Domination. Like, what happened? What what made that happen? Well, we, we after, with the Nation of Domination, man, I, fighting against them, we made a lot of money, man. And it's so funny. We did that for like a year or so, and every time we did it, the crowd would still pop. But uh, when I got put in the Nation... What happened was um, Vince put me in the nation, and uh, then we did a few matches. And then he called me to the office, and he was like, I want to show you something. So he showed me a picture of me, Farouk, Kama, and D'Lo walking down the ramp. And he said, do you see this? He said, who am I going to get to believe that y'all could be beat? Because that was a powerhouse. <laughs> that was a powerhouse lineup. He said, who am I going to get to lead y'all to be here? Except for D-Lo. He could have went somewhere else. We could have got somebody to replace him. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a, a, a powerhouse thing. Then he said, uh, so, Ahmed, I'm going to have to take you back out the nation. I'm like, what? You just put me in the nation. You know, now I got to work with my fans all over again, get them to like me again after I done cussed them out and get all this other stuff. Now I got to work to reverse it. And um, that was that, man. Wow. Yeah, so how long are you in the nation for? I'm sorry, John. That was real tough. Um, it wasn't better. What, maybe what? Was it three months? No, it's not long at all. <laughs> um, yeah, it was like, like, like three months. I'm still, I'm, I'm still talking about the feels from, from being that kid at that time. And, uh, oh, man, you, bro- <laughs> you broke their hearts, man, and joined the nation. And then... As soon as you, you know, you left it and you came back, back, you know, as the red attire and all that stuff, it's kind of like, uh-huh. you broke my, you broke my trust, man. I can't trust you again. <laughs> it wasn't the same after I'm that. I'm sorry about that, man. <laughs> it was all Vince's fault. He broke y'all up. He put you back together. It's not fair. <laughs> but you know what, what, uh, about the nation thing, if you, uh, remember one show where Vince interviewed me and the nation? And we were talking about how white people didn't, how the white man didn't want the black man to get on top and stuff like that. Brother, most of that was a shoot. I mean, most of that conversation, if you get a chance, go back and watch the interview with me and the nation when DOA first came out and watch how we talked. I mean, we were shooting, man, on that one. And I don't think Vince liked it too much either. But we asked him, you know, why didn't it take you so long to crown a black man champion? We asked him on national television, and I don't think he was expecting that. He didn't even answer it. But we asked him, and, you know, it was like, you know, why basically black wrestlers get treated differently than the white wrestlers and this and that. I, I'm sure inside he was burning up. It had to be. Because he didn't know we was going to get on the interview and do that. It's crazy that, uh, you know, The Rock became, like, the first – african-american uh champion but you know he really talks about his samoan side you know exactly so so to us like when mark henry won it he won the wcw title so it still wasn't that wwf wwe tail at the time but when kofi kingston won that title at wrestlemania 35 which i was there in attendance at metlife stadium like i had goosebumps i had tears in my eyes like it was a proud moment i know you probably seen a lot of videos 
or whatnot of Kofi winning the title and all the like the reactions. Right. It was like that was like a genuine moment. I don't know why from when you were the hottest thing back in ninety six to John, what year was that? Twenty uh nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Right. Like it, it took that long for a person like us to win the WWE title. But you know what? I was supposed to win that, that title. I was supposed to uh, twice. I was supposed to have a match with Sean, which he put that bullshit in Vince's head about people not being ready for a black wrestler. He didn't want to wrestle a black wrestler and lose to him to win a championship. And then on, on, on top of that, you know, you had all the other people running their mouth in the background. It was just a lot of jealousy, man. A lot of jealousy. But then I was supposed to take Undertaker on, but I got injured for the World Championship. Probably me and Undertaker, and that would have been a good-ass match. Oh, yeah. But I got oh, injured yeah. and, and, and couldn't, you know, come to the match. So at one point, Vince did, you know, twice he decided to put the belt on me, but the situations came up both times. You know, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, just on my own last night, I watched uh, uh, the SummerSlam 97 with Bret Hart and The Undertaker, and just... Just imagine how you know how you, we all know how that led to the Montreal screw job with Brett and Sean. But what if the month before, with with you, what you know, scheduled to win the WWE title, what would that have done to the Undertaker and the Brett match? And then the, what? How that led to the angle with Brett and Sean later? Like just so many things that you don't think are connected, right. including that. It's just it's just an amazing. Uh, twisted web that the wrestling is, industry is. You know, it's like, like seemingly you have no relation to the Montreal screw job, yet somehow you do. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so it's just a crazy world here. Yeah, because uh, I would have told them if I did the, Mon- the Montreal show, and they told me to, 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 to mess over Brett like that, I would have told them no. I would have told them no. Are I mean, you talking about a man who was at that time was in the business for fourteen years? Never was late, never missed a show, never called in sick. Man, he deserved a lot more pride and, and credit than that, man. They, they screwed him bad. Man, so, like, what was your reaction when you seen that, that Brett got screwed? Oh, I tripped out. I tripped out. I couldn't believe it, man. I couldn't believe it. Then I seen Vince come from the back with that black eye. I'm like, yep. Brett with this. Now he he hit the, he got now Vince went to his locker room after the show. I don't know what he was thinking of. And they say Brett whipped his ass something bad, man. Something bad. Yeah, I mean at that time, you know, there were stories that it 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 uh it separated the locker room, you know, people on Brett's side and Whoever was left was on the Sean the ex- Sean's side, you know, and I heard things like, uh, you know, like uh, Brian Adams, crush of the DOA, was, you know, on Brett's side, Rick Rude, you know, and that's how they ended up saying, screw you, WWF, and they end up in WCW, and some people, even like, you know, like Mick Foley, he, he was not going to show up for a couple weeks, and things like that, um, were you, did you take any stance on that publicly at the time in the locker room? Like, hey, oh, I'm not yeah, going to show had, up. Um, Vince had a meeting after that, the next day. And um, he said, uh, basically trying to explain to everybody why he did it, because Brett was going to WCW, and he didn't want, you know, the belt to be out there like that. And um, he asked, anybody had anything to say? And I, I raised my hand, and I, and I just told him, I said, I, I think that was wrong. So I think that was that was just dirt wrong, the way you did Brett. And he was like, well, you guys just don't understand the, the full picture. Yeah, man, we understand the picture. I mean, he was leaving. We understand that. And he couldn't have a belt and leave, you know what I'm saying, to WCW with the WWF belt. But that wasn't the time in his hometown to screw him over. You know, you, you could have did it a different way. It wasn't. It didn't take you screwing him over in his hometown in front of his people and his family. Yeah. It, it's crazy watching his uh, his documentary uh, "Wrestling with Shadows." That uh-huh. his contract 
it was set to expire maybe what like a month or two months later or something like that so he could have yeah. literally lost the title the next day on monday night raw no problem so it didn't have to to come to that exactly it did not have to come down that i would love to have a match with him and been a, a championship match with brett oh i've been a banger yeah but yeah it didn't, it didn't have to come down to you know you screwing him and embarrassing him in front of his people like that you know what i'm saying yeah yeah, because he didn't debut to WCW, what, maybe until, was that November? So, yeah, literally like a month later, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, you know, is. they screwed him over. Every dog has his day. You know what I'm saying? So, I've been yeah. in trouble now. What are your thoughts on Vince? Like, I know uh, uh, you were one of his guys at the time, but, you know, any any thoughts on, you know, how he was yeah. behind the scenes? You know, behind the scenes, I, I have to be honest. Vince treated me super well. I mean, he, he took, treated me like a like, like a king. I didn't get treated, well, I wouldn't say a king, because I didn't get treated like Shawn Michaels and, you know, Brett and some of the others. But I got treated fairly good. And I got paid fairly good. That's good. So, I mean, I, I give him credit on that. It's just the other thing he was doing to other people didn't sit right with me. Um, you, I, I think, I believe your last match in the WWF was somewhere around February of 1998. Uh, maybe the last match was with uh, Kane or, or Vader at the No Way Out pay-per-view. Uh, what led to your departure from uh, the WWF? Um, I had a, a sister, a sick sister, man. She was really sick. She was in the hospital and she was sick. And um, she had cancer. And she was, we was aware that she was going to pass away soon. And that night I got a phone call and they said, you need to get here because your sister's is not doing well. So I figured I would do the match and then go. And what happened was um, when I got to the back, they had this angle drawn up where the true commission was supposed to beat me and then hang me. Oh, wow. And brother, I was like, wait, whoa, 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 what you mean hang me? And they want to take a rope and hang me from the true commission. And at that time, you got to remember, apartheid was going on in South Africa. All kinds of things were happening. And I was like, I am not going to let my, my brothers and sisters see me go out like that. You know, so I went to Vince's office. We talked, and um, he still by his guns, man. You know, he, he didn't want to straighten it out or, or anything, so... That's when I told him, you know, basically, I was going to walk. And it was a few other things led up to it, but that, that was the main thing. So, just reading, like, the dirt sheets and whatnot, they're saying that you didn't want to put over the, the truth, uh, commission. truth Commission, Kirk, and whatever. So, that was the real reason behind it, the reason why uh, you left w or WWF at the time? No, the reason why... It's because with the true commission, I wasn't about to be hung from the rope by no yeah. damn body. Yeah, I don't blame you. Because that ain't that ain't no joke in the black community. I mean, so many black people have died from that. I had a great great uh, grandfather who was hung. So you know that that wasn't no joke to me. I mean, it might have been to you, but it wasn't to me. And so uh, that and my sister, you no, know, not doing well. It, it just it was just too much, man too much yeah wow yeah i didn't know all that that's that's crazy right there yeah i'm glad you stuck with your guns because no nah. yeah and so yeah, I mean, you know, sh I, shortly I, after I, i'm sorry but shortly yeah, after this uh -huh. you see uh undertaker and big boss man at wrestlemania 15. <laughs> do i know you seen undertaker and big boss man at wrestlemania 15. no i didn't see it oh they hung boss man from the cell Hell in the cell. Oh, did they? Yeah. Oh, brother, I, I wasn't going for that. You wouldn't put a rope, finna put a rope around my neck. No. I mean, what that look like? Some guys from South Africa who were supposed to be racist, not that they're racist, they were good guys, but their gimmick was supposed yeah. to be from South Africa and racist. Yeah. And um, I go out there, a black man, after all these blacks are being hung in Africa, and let them hang me on national television in front of a, a, a Black audience? No, nah, bro. Straight up. 
No, and my, my sister would have seen that too. And you know, she died the day after. After that show. Oh, and that would have been the last thing in her mind. She loved WWF. Yeah. And the last thing in her mind would have been seeing her brother being hung. No. I don't blame you. Even no, if bro, you yeah. did do that that angle, like how would you come back for that for your character? Do what now? So even if you did do that angle right there, how would that how would you come back from that for your character? Like you, you can't. You can't. You can't. Being hung, man, come on, dog. I mean, y'all minorities, y'all know what that's all about, man. Uh-uh. No. That was, that was just too much for me, and I, I couldn't put up. I, I, I wouldn't put up with that, man. I mean, my, my, people say it's, it's pride or whatever. You call it what you want to call it. But it was me not wanting to do that in front of my people. You know, uh, so after after that, with the, with very with very good reason for not uh, participating in that angle and having your release, um, I'm not really sure what happened to you until uh, you showed up in WCW. So that was about a two year period. Uh, so what happened after your release from the WWF? Oh, brother, I wasn't doing nothing. I was sitting at home eating bonbons and getting fat. <laughs> that's it. I was sitting on getting fat, man. That that's because I have never planned on wrestling again. But then um, Stephen Ray called me, and um, like I said, that's my boy. So when he called, there was no way I, I would tell him no, you know, to partner up with him. or, or We partnered up before when we first started our wrestling, you know, back in the indie shows. And um, there was no way I was going to tell him no, although I knew, I knew I shouldn't have went back to wrestling with the weight I had and looking like I was looking. And not being in shape, you know, and getting tired real easy. And but it was all of a sudden he called me out, out the blue. If he'd have gave me like a month or two, I could have really gotten in shape. But he called me out the blue, and I was like, "Hey, brother, you know, you need me. I'm there." Then Ben Russo called me, and you know, we kind of sewed it up from there, and I went. Was Vince Russo uh, was he influential while you were in the WWF? You know, a, a lot of people talk, you know, trash about Russo, man, but he never been nothing but good to me. And, and my my one of my philosophies is you judge a man by the way a man treats you. If you treat me bad, then I'm going to treat you bad. But I have nothing bad to say about Vince Russo, man. I mean, he, he's always a good guy with me. Um, you know, you know Vince Russo. You know he's uh, he's back in the news because of the new series from Vice, uh, who or what killed WCW, and he was all over the latest episode, episode three. Do you do you have any thoughts or opinions on what killed WCW? Them letting the boys run the show. Yeah. Bischoff sitting back and letting the boys run the show. That's what killed WCW. Because NWO ran that. They ran that whole show, man. They ran WCW. And you know they were always gonna make sure they were on top, and that's that's me. Them not giving other people a chance to shine is what killed WCW. So how was it working as a um, big T in Harlem Heat two thousand, brother? That was the, I was I was. It was the worst time of my life because I was so out of shape, man, and. and <laughs> And I was so heavy, man. I'm telling you, walking from the ring to the entrance, I was <laughs> tired, you know. You're blown up. Yeah, blown up big time. And I, and I, and I hate that, you know, that Stevie had to get me at that, can, you know, in that kind of shape and condition. But I wasn't in the shape I was in WWF because I would have turned that place out if I was. But I knew I was out of shape. I knew I wasn't, you know. Ready to get back in the ring, but I did anyway, and, and that was the biggest mistake I made. That's crazy, though. Like with the name Ahmed Johnson, you had a lot of name value. Like, why didn't they contact you sooner? I don't know. I don't know why they, they wait till the last minute to contact me. Like, I could have seen you in the NWO. You could have had, you know, maybe had like a better role than Virgil Vincent, head oh, of security, or anything like that. Yeah. 
Like you yeah. could have definitely, you could have definitely been the enforcer of the NWO. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. But they, like I said, um, NWO. I don't know what their deal was, man. I, I'm, uh, I really don't know what their deal was. But they want to run this show, and they ran the show, brother. And there was nothing you could say or do about it. They had Bischoff in their back pocket. Wow. Wow. So what are your thoughts on the product today? If to you me, still watch. To me, I, I barely, I, I may turn to it every now and then. But to me, the product today is every, every match is a main event match. They don't have jobbers anymore. And jobbers is what we used back in, in the days to get the rapper over. You know, you put them out there four or five times with a jobber, let them squash the jobber, and people see, oh, my God, this dude is good. You know, but the jobbers don't get that anymore. And that way, new wrestlers don't have the chance of making it to the big leagues like they did back when I was wrestling. When I was wrestling, you know, you had jobbers that came like the Hardy Boys, um, and they were one of my first matches, and I squashed them. But now you got every match, it just seems like a main event match. And that gets kind of boring. I mean, how many times can you watch Seth Rollins against Roman Reigns, you know? That, that burns out. And I think they made a mistake by keeping the belt on him that long. Cause, come on, man! It got to the point where it just got to me. It just got boring. I don't know about you guys, but it just got boring after a while. Do you think the right guy dethroned him? Huh? Do you think the right guy dethroned him, Cody Rhodes? You know, I, I didn't. I, I haven't watched Cody Rhodes wrestle that much, so I don't. I, I can't even comment on that. You know, I mean, I, I hear he's a good dude, man, and um, you know, he was worthy of it, but um. I never, I never got to, you know, really watch him like I wanted to watch him. Did you ever have any run-ins or uh, experience with uh, his dad, Dusty Rhodes? No, uh-uh, none. Never. I wish I already got to meet Dusty. But no, I, I didn't get a chance to meet him, man. Can you, uh, any funny or good road stories? Like who used to ride around with uh Traveler Cities with? Oh, it was um look at this car. You see uh, it's like a circus. It was me, Yokozuna, oh, uh Rakishi, uh Ron Simmons, and we all getting out the car and it it was crazy. I remember one time though, we went, you know, we wrapped to late at night and we looked for something to eat. And there wasn't nothing open but uh what White Castle? That's the name of it. Yeah. And when we got to the speaker, I knew it was a sister at the speaker. And she didn't sound very happy because she had to work tonight. It was it's Saturday night a club night, you know, and they're working. And we was giving our orders. And Ron Simmons, what are his stupid, but I told him not to do it. He said, uh, the girl didn't get the order right on the on the speaker. So he was like, bitch. <laughs> I said, oh my God, you should have never have done that. And there's only two black girls working there that night. I said, uh uh. -uh. And I got, when we got our, our food, like an idiot, I got back my food and man, all of the hamburgers were soaked. Like they soaked them in water or something. They might have taken them to the bathroom and stuck them in the toilet. I don't know what they did to them. Uh... But I was like, man, <laughs> I'm not eating this. I told you not to say nothing to them girls. You know, you don't, you don't mess with people who handle your food. You don't was, Yoko, <laughs> was Yoko pissed off? Huh? Was Yoko pissed off? Oh yeah, Yoko was mad. <laughs> you know, Yoko like to eat. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many burgers he ordered that night, but uh, that and then um, I remember the Owen Hart. You probably already heard about Owen Hart. What he did to me, Owen Hart. Um, WrestleMania. I was doing all these interviews with different people, you know, and and different shows and. I got a call into my room one time. I was in my, my room was late at night and the phone rang. So I answered the phone and it was a representative from Jay Leno's show. 
And they're like, you know, we would like to have you on here tomorrow. You know, if you don't mind, just that another. And so they kept asking a bunch of questions like, what's your age? What's your background? Where'd you come from? And this, that, and other. And so I'm happy as I don't know what. Man, I am so happy. I'm thinking I'm going to Jay Leno's show. So I went out and brought me a new suit. Some, I even got a new watch. Everything, man. I was ready to go, man. And so about 7 o'clock hit, and they were going to pick me up like at 8. So I went out to the lobby at 7 and was standing out in the lobby. And then 8 o'clock came, and there was nobody there. No limo, no nothing. And I was like, damn. So Owen and Davey happened to come down by accident. And they started talking to me, man, you on Jay Little Show, that's bullshit. I've been wrestling here for so, so, such years, and I ain't got Jay Little Show. And I was like, man, y'all need to take that up with Vince. That, that's not me. That's, that's Vince doing <laughs> And so uh, we sitting around, and I wonder why they was hanging out with me down there. And then 8 o'clock hit, no limo. So Owen looks at me and said, you late? Ain't your limo supposed to be at 8 o'clock? I was like, yeah, it was supposed to be at 8 o'clock. And I thought, how the hell did you know? My limo was coming at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and when I stopped and looked at him, he knew I figured it out. They just fell on the ground, man, laughing they butts off. <laughs> laughing they butts off. I was like, them, them two there were the two jokers, man. Oh, man. You, you don't want to get in a ha-ha battle with them two because they will get you every time. I know you was probably heated, huh? Oh, man, I spent all this money, dog, on this suit and this watch and <laughs> thinking I'm pimping out, man, and please. I um, wasn't going nowhere. You can wear it to the Slammies, I guess. Uh, huh? You can wear it to the Slammy Awards. Yeah. <laughs> Take it to the Slammy. Uh, yeah. the, Brit the British Bulldog, like another uh, famous opponent of yours. I remember that. You had the uh, arm wrestling competition, and he's like, look at Ahmed. He's got he's like, grease on his arms. Wipe that <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was him always doing. It's too much grease, too much oil. Look at all the oil he had on him. Oh, and I was man. like, man, because I didn't expect Owen to come down. I expected Dave Boy to come down because we had an arm wrestling match. But yeah. Owen came out with him. When I seen Owen come out with him, I was like, oh, my God. That something's up. Something's <laughs> up. You're finna do a ha-ha on national TV, and I don't even know what it is. And um, Owen took a, a, a stink bomb. You know what the stink bombs you can buy? Yeah. He took a stink bomb and put it all over Davey's hands. So when I locked up with Davey, all I smelled was like dog shit. <laughs> I'm like... I'm like, oh my god! And then they just start laughing, and I'm like, oh my god! They did it again, and <laughs> that's how they were. But Bret Hart told me one time, he said, "I meant don't get upset with David on when they play jokes on you." He said, "Cause let me tell you something: they only play jokes on people they like. If they don't like you, they don't mess with you." So I was, I was kind of honored by that because I, I kind of looked up to both of them. Besides the stink bomb and the limo, has Owen ever played like a prank on you in the ring? Like if you guys had a match? Yeah, he did one time he slapped me during that one match. He came up and he slapped me for real and ran out the ring. And I had to chase him around the ring. And we got back in there. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, oh no, brother. Now you finna get Ahmed Johnson treatment now. <laughs> but yeah, he uh for his joke, he slapped me and ran around the ring. So I had to chase him. Wow. Typical Owen fashion. Yeah, I miss them two guys, man. Oh, man. So what are you up to nowadays? Um, I work for an old company called Dresser Ram, man. And um, just, you know, working when I can and, and chilling out the rest of the time. Working, I'm back working out. You still lost all that, that weight I had on me. I lost most of the I, I was like 400 and something pounds and i lost just about all that i'm down to three something now that's good that's good do you have a routine or what are you doing anything particular to drop the weight no basically just dieting and, and, and working out man yeah. just the, the usual you know routine i like that shirt that's a dope shirt yeah a big beast man yeah i like that beast mode <laughs> I'll definitely rock that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna get so, some more made, man. I'll make sure I get you one. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, All right, so you have people. it. You have um any advice for any upcoming wrestlers? 
to upcoming wrestlers. You know, the sad part about me doing this, I have to give advice, different advice to uh, minority wrestlers than I do the white guys. And that and that's sad. But if you're a minority wrestler, all you can do, man, is, is, is go in there and I guess do whatever they tell you, you know. And you got to, you know, set yourself up for it. Just, just know that when you sign that contract, your life is no longer your life. Your life belongs to them promoters. And so it was, um, it's kind of a double-edged sword, man. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, there's some white wrestlers out there that, man, I just love to death. But then you got your handful that was in the WWF that was racist. I, I don't know what. But they, they didn't come to me and let me know straight out there, right? They knew who to mess with and who not to mess with. But Virgil, like like Virgil, man, they just dogged Virgil out so bad, man. Um, Kamala was dogged out and missing you so bad. You know, now these brothers are gone. And I, are you in the Hall of Fame? Either one of them? I don't think so. Not in the WWE Hall of Fame. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't think he's one of the Hall of Fame, but you know, they just they just dog them out, man. They treated them like some pure slaves, man. It, it was it was terrible. Some of the stuff I got from Kamala, way they treated him, and you know, would short his cut his pay for nothing. And one time he told me that he went to um, I forgot what what city it was. But um, the dressing room was full, and they asked him to get dressed outside in the snow. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, brother, before I got there, there were a lot of brothers that, you know, got the bad end of the stick. Now, I think it's the way they carried themselves. They, they carried themselves to the point where they were too nice. And, and Kamala was a gentleman to anybody. And um, I think that they took advantage of that. You know, they were taking advantage of. Yeah, it's sad. I don't know why it had to be like that, but because you're yeah. African, you're African American at the time. You're Kamala. He was drawing money with Hogan and yeah, he Junkyard. Was money big time. Yeah, Junkyard Dog was drawing money too. So, oh, JYD, man, JYD should have been the first black heavyweight champion. Got JYD, the crowd was there. Most of them were there to see JYD. Although I don't know who was the, their golden boy at the time. Um, who was the golden boy back, back then? In WWF? Yeah. At the t- Hogan. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. How do I forget that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hogan was the golden boy back then. And so, um, you know, they kind of just, just did what they wanted to do with JYD. He should have been a champion, man. He should have been a champion. Yeah. And now they're, you know, they're gone. So if you put them in the Hall of Fame now, what good is it doing? They, they can't see it. You know, they can't, you know, get the perks from it. I mean, what good to do now? And the thing about it is that really pisses me off is that they don't care. They don't care. Now, I don't know how this new team of producers are doing with, you know, Triple H and Sean and uh, the guy from the UFC. I don't know how they're doing it, but they seem to have a lot more black wrestlers in there, but they don't seem to be really pushing any of them. Now it's like everybody, it's more organic. Like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with Shane Swerve Strickland. Like, he's over. Who? Shane Str- uh, Strickland, Swerve Strickland, the AEW. Yeah, I remember. I heard. I've yeah, heard he's the heavyweight champ over there, and he's over. The fans love him. NXT has Trick Williams over. The fans love him. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's uh you know definitely developing. It's all organic. Like yeah. they they come up with their own characters, and the fans just fall in love with them. You know, I, I'd like to think that. The blacks that are there now and the blacks who are being pushed, I would like to think I opened the doors for them. God, literally, I did, being the first black champion. So, literally, I did open the doors for them. But um, I don't know if the brothers recognize that. You know what I'm saying? 
you guys, they, they uh, were there with, you know, other people. And I don't think they recognize who opened the doors for them. But that's okay, too. Will we ever see you make an appearance in a AEW or WWE ring? One more never, time? never know. <laughs> never. I'll put it like this. I'm not getting in shape for nothing. I'm not pumping iron for nothing, brother. I, t- I tell you one thing, Ahmed, is that, uh, you know, a lot of modern wrestlers, they steal a lot of finishes from the old the old timers. Ain't no one stealing that Pearl River plunge, so it's <laughs> all yours. Does. It's all yours. <laughs> Nobody did a perfect blunt, man, because you got to have strength when you do that. Because oh, you got to lock the guy's arms in the back of him. And then when you lift, you got to kind of lift him from the arm. If you do it wrong, you will pull his whole shoulder out of socket. Yeah, man, you, know. you, were, you were a beast. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Still, still, still are, but yeah, at that time, man, what a specimen. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I tried, man. I you tried. One of uh, you know one of your early opponents, of course, was Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Did you think he had the capability to become who he is today, running WWE? I wouldn't have thought that in a million years. I mean, his ability to wrestling, he's one of the greatest wrestlers ever, ever. But I never thought that he would have the uh, <laughs> the pool like he got now and the money he has now. Yeah. You know, and I never thought that would happen. But he, he knew what he was doing. He played his cards right. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And so it's been a pleasure for you to be on the show. But I have one more question. Can you, uh, can you still cut a promo? I don't know. My wife and daughter would trip out if they heard me here cutting a promo. <laughs> <laughs> they would probably come running in the room. <laughs> yeah, but I still can cut a promo, man. All right. Definitely need to see you on TV, man. Get one of them Legends deals so you can be in the video games and all that, man. Oh, bro, you never know what might happen. All like right. I said, I'm not working out and getting in shape for nothing. Hey, hey. You, know, you, know, you know, we'd love to see it for sure. So there you go. Let's, let's keep it going. Let's make it happen. <laughs> As the kids say nowadays, let's go. <laughs> And I don't hate the person. I hate the gimmick. They bring uh, Goldberg in. Because all they were trying to do was bring in an Ahmed Johnson. Yeah. Goldberg yeah. tried to be an Ahmed Johnson. And, uh, you know, he had the advantage because of the skin color. But outside of that, mm-mm. I would have loved to wrestle him, man. Nothing, I mean, got nothing bad about the dude. I don't even know him. But, I mean, just his style and my style, I would love to have matched them up. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I was gonna ask. Uh, you know, f- yeah, I, I know you didn't get into wrestling as a huge fan, but did you have any dream opponents for people uh, during your time, before your time, and up to today? Like any dream people you'd love to wrestle? Well, during my time, I would have loved to have had that match with the Undertaker. Mm. I think that would have been a hell of a match. Oh yeah, definitely. And. In the future time, I I think I would love to have a match with Brock Lesnar. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I, yes. I think that would have been a good match. Oh, yeah. Because, I'd, ooh, you know, a we're match. both kind of shooters, but we do it with, with respect. You know? And I like Vader. Vader, man, was the, the match I love the most to have. Because Vader came, we had our first match. Vader came to the locker room. I was in the locker room. Vader came to the locker room. And he said, uh, I'm in. He said, uh, I want you to land me in there, man, because I'm going to land there on, I'm gonna land him in on, on you. I'm going to hit you hard, man. And I was like, he's just playing. He ain't going to hit me hard. Shit. First punch he threw, man, my head was ringing like I don't know. I said, okay, that kind of match. So we with that match, if you ever get a chance to catch that match, that whole match was a shoot match with respect. I mean, I was shooting with Vader, and he wasn't somebody that was going to go cry. Oh, he hitting too hard to Vince or anything. He just took it, and I just took it. And it was a, a big shoot match. So if you ever watch that match, know that everything in that thing was real. Wow. Those are the best matches, man. When, you, when you're when you cool with the guy, 
Lay it in. Yeah. Yeah. When, you, when he respects you and you respect him, it could be a hell of a match, man. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't going to shoot enough to try to kill him. But, you know, I laid him in there to where you would know I'm in there. Like another person I had a match like that with was uh, Brashaw back in Sportorio. Oh, wow. Me and Brashaw had a hell of a match. I don't know why they didn't put us together in WWF. Because we had a hell of a match, man, at Sportorium. And and Brashaw's a shooter and I'm a shooter. We just went at it, man. Those are the best matches. Yeah, I, yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I might have to go check out that Vader and, and your match. Yeah, the Brashaw match uh, on um, YouTube, I watched that the other day. Yeah? Yeah, me and Brashaw back in the Sportatorium days. Okay. You remember the Sportatorium, huh? That was before my time, but I know that's like Von Eric territory right there. Yeah. Yeah. Now you made me feel old, since before you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, we, we, we had a hell of a match, me and Brashaw, man. Hell of a match. I had forgot all about it until I watched it on YouTube the other day. YouTube got everything, man. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Just type in your name and, and, you know, see what pops up. Oh, yeah. A bunch of haters. Yeah, that too. I, I see, you know, some people, you know, talk negatively about, about yourself. and. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just a bunch of haters, man. And, and the, the thing about it is that, that really pisses me off about that is it's not as much the white guys as it was the black guy. You know what I'm saying? Like they said, D'Lo Brown beat me up in the locker room. Who in the hell gonna believe D'Lo Brown beat me up? <laughs> and that didn't start that rumor until after I was gone for like 10 years. Then that rumor came out. I was like, now D'Lo Brown had beat me up in the locker room the dirt sheets would have wrote all about it. You guys on, on podcast wouldn't knew about it. Everybody would have knew about it. Man, come on. And they're, they're just making stuff up, and I don't know why. There's a rumor. It said that you roofied Mark Henry because he don't drink. Yeah, I don't know where they get I didn't even mess with drugs like that, man. But in fact, to be honest with you, I don't want to sound stupid or anything, but I didn't even know what a roofie was. More than put one to drink. I know, I remember, I won't say his name. Somebody did put something to drink one time, but I won't say who did it because it's none of his, his business. And since he accused me of doing it, then let it be that. But I knew who really did put something in his drink because they didn't like him. But I won't say his name because I don't want, you know, start no, no trouble with him. So, yeah. Uh, it, it's just crazy that, you know, like the power of social media and the internet and all these yeah. podcasts and blogs and, you know, you're hearing all the, like the, the dirt from back in the day. Like, it's just, just crazy hearing all these stories like, wait, wow, this guy, he did this. Oh, he's a, you know, piece of shit, whatever. But it, it's well, just, know, just crazy. The thing is about, about that, dog, I don't mind them saying I was a heavy hitter. You know what I'm saying? Or, or just too much intensity or whatever they want to say. But don't use there and tell lies, man. You don't have to break up lies. That just pisses me off. You know, and they sit in and tell them stories that, that's not true. I mean, what I want to roof his fat ass for? He, he wasn't even <laughs> wrestling as me. <laughs> Shit, McGill the gorilla looking at him. I ain't even roof his ass. <laughs> oh <laughs> uh, yeah it was just a crazy time but like i said we don't know we just you know we see things on the internet we hear things on right. podcasts and whatnot we don't know we don't know your side of the story so it's, it's just weird just to, right. to see all that stuff especially you yeah. know one of your own type of people you know exactly your brother so yeah that, that's what cuts me deep, man, when the brothers, you know, start telling lies and talking about it. I'm like, man, we got a hard enough in this industry as it is, and then you're going to make up stories? Just jealousy, dog. It was so much jealousy and envy, it, it was sickening, man. 
I mean, instead of you being glad that another brother finally broke that barrier of being champion, you go and make up stories and tell lies on it because you wasn't the one that they wanted to be champion. I don't know, dog. That's just the word of where it is, I guess. All right, man. Well, we ended on that note, but we appreciate you being on the show. Hey, bro, appreciate you having me. Uh, no problem. You want to tell the people where they can follow you at? Where they can find um, you? I'm just on, on Facebook, man, and, and on, on Instagram. And to be honest with you, I don't know what my Instagram account is. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I just started it. So, well, Victor started it. My, my, my agent, he started it for me. So, I, I don't even remember what it is. So, they can get me on Instagram or just hit me up on Facebook, man. I love talking to the fans. I love talking to my fans. They hit me on Facebook. And I guarantee you, not one fan that ever wrote me that could say I didn't answer him back. And you're talking about a ton of people. But, you know, I appreciate you guys having me, man. And, and hey, more power to you. Yeah, this is a, definitely a dream. We all, we have another friend. Well, he's not here right now. He just had a baby. But uh, we were all Ahmed Johnson fans growing up as a kid. So it Yeah, was I appreciate cool, that, man. So. I appreciate all the support you guys gave me, bro. Got the man a lot. Yeah, man. So, John, anything you want to say? Just, uh, I was glad to have a chance to talk to you and fanboy out a little bit, tell you <laughs> all the things I love about your career. So, uh, thanks for listening and thanks for being on our show. And you've been an absolute gentleman. So, thank you very much. John, thank you, brother. Y'all, y'all been great to interview with, man. Great to interview with. No problem. All right, guys. Well, I'm the notorious one. I am Dom. I'm here with Strat Facts, and we are here with WWF legend. Hopefully, he'll be in the Hall of Fame soon. The first African American Intercontinental Champion, Tony Norris, also known as Ahmed Johnson. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. See you guys later, bro. Boom.